So we were talking about the neutral bone about kicking out the heels, right? And the thing for me is the heels, if you don't, if you don't kick them out and give you a chance to sit on them, there, there should be a visible height drop. Just being to go from toes in one position, boom, to drop the heel to the other. If I drew a little line behind my head, there should be, won't be a big one, but there should be a perceivable shift, right? I'm going from standing with my toes facing one way to kicking out the heels, having them facing the other. And if I'm in a neutral and I'm facing this way and I transition to 1040, I should see an advancement with an increased amount of weight on this leg that takes my torso from back here to here. So I bring my rear weapons into play and increase my reach. Um, two red lines. What most people think of when they hear about getting their feet squared away on a neutral bow is, you know, picture the lines like this and they take their big toe and their big toe goes like this, the lines, and they go there. I'm, I'm lined up, right? But where does that put the heel? It puts the heel inside. The ray or the toe that gets lined up is the bone for the foot, for that middle toe. And that bone as it goes to the foot is a piece that you want to line up on this. So if I'm like this, and I want to line up the bone from my middle finger, my middle toe, I have to kick my heels out to get those parallel to these front lines. So in contrast, it's kicking my heels out, right? But I'm not like going way out here. I'm just I'm starting in a natural stance. Natural stance usually has our great toe pointing forward. And I'm going from natural stance, kicking my heels out. That was an over rotation, right? Kicking my heels out so that that middle ray is going in the direction of my, of my north, my 12 o'clock. If we take a neutral bow, like stepping forward into a right neutral bow, again, we're not doing an over, over rotation. I take my natural step and I'm turning like this. And then I just want to make sure that my, my, that central ray of the foot is running perpendicular to the line of the neutral bow. So I'm still, I'm still at 12 o'clock, I'm still facing my bad guy like this, right? But what I've done is instead of stepping into him in a side fighting horse, where this is the, the, my 12-6 line, my feet are going like this, I've stepped off that line just a smidge, and once I've achieved that step, I sell my weight, I drop, I kick my toes out, so that again, that middle toe bone in the foot, that central ray, is going this way. Because now this is my new straight. I'm basically in a horse dance facing like 1030, but in my horse dance facing 1030, I take my head, my attention, and I turn it to my 12, right? I'm in my neutral. Now when I want to go to a forward, this heel slides this way, right? It doesn't have to come all the way into a, you know, 12, six line. It can get to about just part way. So like right now I've got them here. If I spin that heel to about here and I'm halfway between a neutral and I'm halfway between a forward and a neutral, I get to about half that halfway point, that will give me the ability to deploy my rear weapons and recoil quickly without losing anything in the timing or the beat. Um, I have, the reason I do this thing, I have a couple of pavers in my house. I'll see if I can, I can tape them for you and send them in, or send you that. And the pavers are set up almost perfectly where the big grout crack is in line with my horse. I step to horse dance and bam, I'm right there. And I'll stick my big toe in the grout, right? And I've got my heels off the grout groove and I'll just, and I'll settle, and I'll kick my heels out and let my body settle into that horse as I drop into that, that stance and I sit down in it, right? Um, if you're not sitting in your stance, if you kick your heels out but you remain high in your horse, you're not gonna have that, the center, and that, the, the, <sighs> sorry for the disorganization. You, the generation of guys like Sepulveda and Tommy Burks and people like that were being preened to be regional quality control directors if Mr. Parker became ill, old, what have you. Um, the running joke is they were picked to be disciples and that kind of stuff. And I think um, with Mike Molino, we were at that same thing when Burks was recalling Spall, but I was saying, you know, you're supposed to be one of those guys. And Burks like, yeah, I know, I, I, I was being pranked, I knew that. Um, and there's a couple of them out there, a lot of them have clammed up. Some are still active, have changed what they're doing, um, but they were out there. And one of the big things that Mr. Parker was working on all of them with was the notion of framing. And framing is this idea about um, anatomical alignment and structural integrity as being the platform for launching an attack from. And we were talking about, you know, 
hitting the stance of the, is why is this stronger than if I bring my check back here like this? Why do I have more strength here than I, than I do back here in all directions? And that was part of framing. If you talk to guys like Sepulveda and whatnot, they're really big on it. And it has to do with something called the palantonic reflex that they talk about more in body work and exercise physiology than they do in neurology. But it's this idea that the body seeks balance around the middle. And I always think of the, um, the real in the cartoons, they have those exercise things. It's a handle here and a handle here and a bunch of springs here along the middle. You can go like this. And eventually someone pinches a bunch of chest hair in the, in the spring, you know. If you try one of those things, you don't go like this, right? They track each other, right? And as they track each other, you create this frame. I was watching people try to work out on the hammer strength machine for, for chest press, elevated incline chest, and the hammer strength is isolated. I mean, you can move each individual thing with its own stack of weights at the same time. So if I wanted to, I could put 60 pounds on this side and 40 pounds on this side and work my left more than my right. It's a choice. Um, what most people do is they squeeze them out at the same time. And when people squeeze out ones, when that right arm pops, that left hip goes plink and shoots forward to try to stabilize the trunk against the pressure of this right arm pushing forward. That's a great example of palantonic reflex. The body's counterbalancing itself around the middle. So I have this, this diagonal thing that I've gone from this right shoulder stability to the left hip stabilization, and I'm finding that balance with the midline right through the, or the center, right through that X. So in a horse, in neutral bow, bam, you kick those heels out. There's a palantonic piece about why you want the feet to be relatively kind of exact to each other. Kick, kick, settle, drop. The knees push out, right? Rather than just having them going like, I got a hip, a knee, and a foot. But by God, my foot's kicked out, right? The knee gets pushed out to here, so it's over the foot. There should have to be a straight drop line from knee to foot. So you go knee out, or I'm sorry, hip out to the knee, down to the foot. And that should be visible in the horse. Of what if I was here, if I'm in a horse dance facing 1030, I should be able to go to 1030 and see that square horse called square because that, right? People think it's called a square horse because they'll see, you know, the secrets of Chinese camp when they're doing Chinese box drills around that thing. They go, well, that's a square. That must be what's called a square horse. It's called a square horse because if you get your hips, knees, and feet all in alignment, there should be a perfect square. So you got your bell knot, right? And you have your hip. The hip comes out, hits a knee, Knee comes down, hits a foot. Opposite side, femur comes out, goes to a knee, knee comes down, goes to a foot. This is your square. If your knees aren't pushed out, you're not a square horse. And again, it's about that palatonic reflex. If I push one out but not the other, my body's not gonna be able to find that, that middle center to push from. So I wanna make sure that I'm framing properly, right? If I hit an hour block, I can hit an hour block like this, my other arm freehand, still an outward block, I've kind of met it, I go like this, and that'll be okay. It's a pretty good robotic learning position for an hour extended block. If I go like this, right, I've got a better frame going on. And if you took it like the look at the guys from Pix Camp, they're doing this, they've got that over wide neutral bow, but they're starting off already framed, right? And their neutral bow feels to me like it's halfway between a horse and a neutral. They got their legs really far apart. But at least they're home and they're framed and they're stable. And you can see it. They're not going anywhere. You go talk to one of these guys, you're going to hit a wall. They're not moving. Um, we can do the same thing in a regular neutral bow without having to go over wide like the pit guys do. You can hit that angle that has you here or here. Kick the heels out, drop, bow out the knees. And if you hit all of those at the same time, boom, there should be a diminishment in your height and a settling of your weight, right? Um, if you don't do it, there won't be. Try it, kick through it a couple times. Mr. Parker used to hit people with his stances, which is to say he'd, you know, place his hand on a dummy's chest in a high position, slide one foot forward almost to a cat, and then, and then sort of drop and just let the pivoting into the neutral bow and dropping and just letting this thing roll through his body. Um, Body English is another piece. It's the notion that the body leaves first and then the hand follows. But in Kempo, we don't telegraph, right? That's true. We don't rear back like this and throw the blow. But what we can do 
and I got to thank Hawkins for this analogy because I was using too many words from anatomy and physiology to try to describe this. A plyometric stretch will replace a pre-stretch on a muscle before we throw it. It's why people intuitively draw back before they hit because they know if they get some reach and some stretch on that thing, they can hit harder. So I don't want to come back this way and hit. What I can do is freeze my hand at that line and advance my body and then release the hit, right? So that kind of advanced or plyometric stretch followed by dropping is something that I think would be really good to work on. Um, if I practice point of origin to point of contact, I'm just going to go from here to here. I'm not going to be able to get body English in there. I'm not going to be able to leave my torso and then unwind that, that throw. Um, something Mr. Parker did a lot when he wasn't doing demos and he was just trying to demonstrate how you lose your shit on someone, but he, would, he wouldn't use those words. That's what we call throwing stones. And throwing stones or softballs, you don't keep it controlled, right? When we do stuff in Kempa, we go, here's my block, here's my chop, here's my palm, and everything's controlled and it's pretty, right? He'd go like, Bleh! like he just took a stone and threw it, right? And he'd go, Bleh! then when it came time to chop, Bleh! and everything was like to whip and throw him, like he was trying to skip a stone across a pond. Nobody skips a stone like this. But we'll do our hands works that way. If you skip a stone, you go, and you take everything you have and you whip it into it. That's the same way you do his hands work. Boom! Throw that stone and whip everything you have. Um, so when we get to techniques and stuff, we'll look at the mechanics, which will be done slow, which will be done pretty tough. But when we go to the application, we start hitting the, you know, the, the speed up button on it. What I want you guys to do is instead of just thinking about it in terms of hitting harder and faster, I want you to think in terms of losing your shit throwing stones. Um, and if you had something in your hand, how far can you throw it? And we start going for performance improvement. But the harder you can throw it, the farther you can throw it, the harder you're gonna hit. If I think about a smothering punch, a smothering punch, if I'm using my reflection this way, starts high in this position, comes down across the face, and goes back, and it hits right there, and goes black, spins the head this way. But it starts this position here first. So I go like this. And I go across my body, right? If I throw my smothering sponge, like, you know, hour block, smothering punch. I've got a nice stop. I, mean, I, look, I look really good, right? This looked in the form. As opposed to going, hour block, and I just, boom, I've got a stone. I've got to chuck that stone as hard and as far as I can. The blows are going to have very different effects when you hit a guy. And I've, I've done it myself before I started getting into hard hitting tempo. I right? hit a guy 14, 15 times and he didn't, didn't even respond. Um, I see other guys do it. They get in a fight and they, and all they do is piss the guy off because they're not throwing that other shit that they have. Remember the thing that was scary about Mr. Parker is he throw stones, come this close to your face and not hit you. But you realized what exactly would happen to your body if he hit you with that stone. If he hit you with that smothering punch that just came this close to your nose and made your eyebrows flutter, you know, I have my fucking face crushed. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll do this incrementally. So, think about that neutral, think about kicking those things up, think about dropping and settling, right? I have my natural position, I take my step to my, you know, what, what is that, 1030, and then I, right, there's me, and I drop, um, Rich Hale likes telling a story of Doc and you know, Doc Chappelle and Parker dropping, all they're doing is settling in their boom, neutral mode. They're kicking those heels out, sitting down and letting their body go boom, and grip the floor with the toes. And it's making the piano ring. And they leave the room for a second. He's trying to get the piano ring. It came, won't work. And he's thinking, maybe you just have to be bigger and heavier, fatter to make it happen. So he climbs up on the piano bench, gets ready to jump off this thing. Oh, crap, are they coming yet? Last thing he wants to do is be standing on a piano bench, jumping down on the floor, trying to make the piano go hmm when these guys are doing just by going, right? So that, that settling, that kicking out the heels, dropping, bowing your knees and sitting down in your stance will become part of the thing that we use as part of our weapon so that we'll time the step and the, right now I'm in a cat, I'm going to pivot to a neutral and then drop. And that all takes place from here to here, right? And I throw all that stone. So... Give that a couple of whacks, see what you come up with.